Well, good afternoon, everyone. It's another beautiful day at, at the Googleplex. Um, my name is Cliff Redeker, and I'm with the Authors at Google team. Um, it's my pleasure today to introduce Marie Brenner. She is an author and writer whose works have appeared pretty much anywhere, from, from Vanity Fair and Vogue to The New Yorker. Um, her investigative work on the tobacco industry resulted in the article, The Man Who Knew Too Much, which was eventually developed into a, a feature film, um, The Insider. So that's, um, that's pretty, pretty interesting trivia right there. Um, her books range in subject from the Bingham family of, of Louisville to the Grand Dames of Society. Um, today she'll be speaking to us about her latest book, which is called Apples and Oranges, My Brother and Me lost and found, in which she turns her gaze, her gaze into one of the most fundamental relationships of humanity, that of siblings, brothers and sisters. After the talk, Marie will be available for any signatures and questions you might have. We'll go ahead and give a, an overview to the book and then a little bit of time for, for discussion as well. Um, for the benefit of our YouTube and virtual audiences, um, we ask if you please use the microphone for questioning, which I will circulate when the, when the time is right. And with that being said, please join me in welcoming Marie Brenner. Hi, everybody. It's so incredible to be at Google. Amazing day we've had. So today, a brother story, a brother-sister story in five short parts. First, the setup. A story. Washington State, an apple orchard, a very intense woman in black is making her way on a surprise visit to meet her older brother. He's in the middle of a harvest. He's a trial lawyer turned apple orchardist. She, he believes, is a fancy hotshot reporter for a certain magazine. He's not expecting her, so she surprises him. So then I'm landing, right in the middle of this apple orchard where I've never been, in the middle of this glorious apple country. I don't want to tell my brother that I'm coming because I've developed an obsession. I want to make this relationship better. It's a piece of my life that I've kept in an attic that I never talk about. People would say, do you have a sibling? And I'd say, oh, yes, I have an older brother. And then they would say, well, are you close? And I would say, we speak once a week. And then I would change the subject. In fact, I did speak with my brother once a week, and the conversations were always the same. You could have put them on an egg timer. It isn't that we were so apart from each other. We were just different. And my great obsession with this book began to solve the mystery of how could two people who had grown up in the same house with the same parents become virtual strangers as adults? How could we be such opposites? So my brother and I, on, the, on paper, we had absolutely nothing in common. He was a red state trial lawyer turned apple orchardist, uh, a guy who had an NRA sticker on the back of his truck. We were so, I was the one that he called the New York City ACLU lib with her liberal reporter friends. And there we were, a red state and a blue state. So I'm landing in the orchard, and my brother is astonished to see me. The first thing he said to me is, you're not getting a divorce, are you? That proceeded to a job that he gave me at the packing house. Now, first of all, I was so blown away when I got out to the orchards because I had never seen anything like the beauty of it. And I'm embarrassed to say, standing up here, that it took me about 15 years to make this trip with my brother. You'll see why. On the first day, he puts me to work in the packing house, which was fun. I got to sit on the floor and count boxes. Of course, I made a lot of bizarre comments about how this wasn't a proper use for my skill set. I was the know-it-all, have-to-know-everything expert that my brother believed I was. And I was working on these boxes, counting them for him, and suddenly I was working with a marking pen, and my brother, who was very neat and a bit of a control freak, the pen top 
rolled under a flatbed uh, a truck in the, in the warehouse, and I couldn't get to it. So I'm groveling on the floor trying to get underneath this truck. When I, and I began to panic. I had that little sister panic moment of thinking, oh, my God, my brother is going to be furious with me. And I began twinging. And suddenly I realized... I'm frozen in amber here. We are still fighting as if we were in the back seat of a car. That is the definition of the brother-sister swamp. So many of us share this problem with siblings. And as I've been writing this book over the last couple of years, I have often thought about what my mother used to call us, apples and oranges, complete opposites. And yet, what I discovered is that so many of us have this yearning to connect with our siblings, to try to make it better. I'll start with a question. How many of you in this room have a complicated relationship with your brother or sister that you would like to change or make better? Let's see some hands. Ah, we're right at the national average. We are at 45%. You know, by age 11, sibling experts will say that you are spending about a third of your time with your brothers and sisters, far more than you spend with your parents, far more than you spend with your friends. And yet, it's only been in the last decade or so that these experts have begun to talk about brothers and sisters and their immense power over us and how their behavior affects us in so many different ways, how we react to our brothers and sisters as we do, we can feel that reaction as we do out in the world with our bosses, our friends, even our partners. I've been thinking a lot about this during the most recent, the, the most recent just sort of dust up between Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton, and it is fascinating. Another question. How many of you have had moments where you're not getting along with a coworker or you're having problems with your, your partner or some, one of your friends, and suddenly you think, hmm, I'm reacting to this person just like I do to my brother or sister, or this idiot reminds me of my brother or my sister. Let's, 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 just that little twinge moment. Okay, good. Again, here we go. This is what experts call the sibling iceberg. What that means is the buried image that you carry around with you is that image you take out to the world. It's that, that certain tweaky image from the campaign trail. Think about Barack Obama, this golden child with his drive-by siblings, the guy who stands up to be de debating with Hillary Clinton, Hillary Clinton debating Barack Obama. I saw this for the first time in the CNN debate, and it was incredible. She rose up in like this complete kind of bossy, demonic firstborn, older sister thing. You know, as we know, she's a, she's a woman who has two younger brothers, Hugh and Tony, and she's had to both discipline them and she's also protected them, cosseting them with their presidential pardons and, uh, you know, letting them in the back door of the White House. So she has a kind of a classic firstborn older sister personality. There was that moment in the debate, maybe you saw it, when she stood up and you could just feel her wanting to just swat Barack Obama down. There it is, the sibling iceberg. She became the perfect firstborn of two um, sons. Siblings, part two, the backstory. My first memory of my brother was when he sailed me out the window when I was three years old. And the family, I was rushed to the hospital. He was a five. The family joke became that he gave me the gift of a hard head. We were down in Texas, and we grew up in this incredible rollicking household. My father was a kind of a, a, an amateur district attorney who spent a lot of his time exposing corruption. He inspired my own career. And my brother, firstborn, very much took his 
took his lead. But by the age of 10, my brother, who was already a member of the Young Republicans of San Antonio, was the only kid in our elementary school who was a member of the John Birch Society, which was an organization then in the 60s which registered alleged communists. So imagine this scene of a brother and sister having so little in common. He would come into my room. I was already collecting Joan Baez records. He would come in and say, I have it right here on my list. Joan Baez is a communist. Then he would smash the records. So by the time we got to be adults, we were still very loyal. We would speak on the phone once a week, but we were polar opposites, the red state and the blue state. Part three, how to make this better. For me, it started with a crisis, an absolute bomb that came into the house. And often, sibling experts will tell you, crisis is an editor. It is not an editor that anyone wants, but it is an editor. We were together for Thanksgiving weekend. My brother, sexy, alpha guy, brilliant apple orchardist, flew his own plane, had this extraordinary kind of Anne Rand quality of the man in the mountain, always had five girlfriends around him or a string of girlfriends. He was divorced, no children. He just reveled in his independence. You know, you could just think he resembled Harrison Ford a bit, and you could just see him with that kind of man in the mountain, Howard Rourke thing. In fact, I used to call him the Howard Rourke of fruit, thinking of him as the kind of extraordinary architect that Anne Rand gave us so memorably in The Fountainhead. A letter arrives. We had been at Thanksgiving together, and like always with my brother and me, maybe many of you share this, I overscheduled activities so we wouldn't have to talk too much. Thanksgiving and holidays were always our battleground. The letter came right after Thanksgiving, a FedEx. I thought, how odd. We've just been together. What could be so important that he would send me a FedEx? Why couldn't he have just told me something? I open it up, and it began, I'm asking you to help me save my life. He had developed a very rare form of lung cancer, a non-smoker's lung cancer. And we then embarked on a journey together to make this relationship better, to try to figure out how to come together. It wasn't easy. The first part of this was going out to the apple orchards, and it was learning how to see each other as we really were, not how we wanted each other to be. That was our first step, and it was powerful. It began, like everything in families, often with an eruption, an explosion of rage. We were a family that had absolute, we, we always communicated in anger. So there we were in the apple orchards. And I hadn't really, I was nervous about coming. I flew all the way out, out the country. It was just after 9-11. And I can just... Just, I just said to my husband, I must go out and make this better with my brother. So I spent the two days before I went. I said, I'm going to surprise him because he'll tell me not to come. And I spent the two days before I went out shopping at Patagonia because I wanted to have orchard perfect clothes. You know, here I was, you know, always in black, typical New York City. I drove my brother crazy. He always thought I had to be the know-it-all expert. So I'm racing around New York, and I'm getting flannels, and I'm getting fleeces. And as I go, I leave all of it on a heap on the bed. And as I'm racing out the door, I was wearing what I always wore, black, and a black turtleneck. And my husband said, black turtleneck, black cashmere at the orchard, Carl is not going to like that. So I flew across the country, and on the plane, so panicked after 9-11, I remember having all my files, my notes, and I was studying apples and how to cultivate them, how to grow them, because I wanted to appear smart to my older brother. I wanted him to, to like me better. And you, if you looked at me, you would have thought, well, here's a lawyer, or here's a professor, or here's a reporter working on a story. And 
I was treating my own brother as if he were a source, someone that I was set to interview. Pens, tape recorders, pads, I had them all. Part four, the shock. Landing in the apple country. I drift down into some beautiful trees at harvest time. Thousands of acres in Washington state where every kind of pear and fruit, everything is growing and it's harvest and it's glorious, the Cascade Mountains, blue skies. And I called up my brother and told him I was landing. And he was again kind of shocked. And I drove over to a packing house where he was working, and I suddenly saw him from a distance, and he was taking all of the fruit that he had, that he had harvested, and he was watching them as these millions of apples came down the flumes. And I looked at him, and this guy that I thought was my bossy, red state, judgmental older brother was suddenly a complete different person. I was able to see something in him that I had never seen before, and it astonished me. It was extraordinary. I saw in him a tenderness, and I wrote down in my journal, Carl, all he needs is a blue sweater to look like Mr. Rogers. I mean, that was how, that's what a revelation it was for me. And that really was the beginning of the beginning. The next day, however, there we were, in one of his groves where he was growing experimental Honeycrisp apples. Now, for those of you who have ever had a Honeycrisp, they are the most wonderful apple you can possibly have. They are the caviar of fruit. And he said, try this. You're going to love this apple. So I bit into it, and it exploded with this kind of wonderful sweetness, taste. And suddenly, my cell phone rang. And it was a close friend of mine calling. And she said, what are you doing? So I just waxed on in full New York City hyperbole. I became the little sister that always had to know everything in front of her brother. And I said, you won't believe these incredible apples. They're the most, the sweetest. They're the greatest. Carl is growing them. But they're difficult to grow here because the soil is much too stony. So... Now, remember, I've never been to the apple country. This is my first day. But, of course, I know everything. I'm the expert. Little sister. And my brother said, he, I hang up, and he, my brother flares at me and said, they're not too stony, the soil. It's too, it's too sandy here. You always act like you know everything. What are you doing here anyway? And we had this explosive argument over this, what I thought, complete nothing comment. It was so classic brother-sister, a moment that just resonated with something that had a far greater and complicated meaning. The moment. How do you make it better with a brother and sister? I'm often asked that. And one of the steps is this. Try to see them as they really are. It happened this way for me. We were walking in the orchards, and it was so beautiful to see what my brother had grown here. Again, this great romantic vision he had for the apple. And he was walking ahead of me. And suddenly I saw every color of green, every single leaf on a tree. And I was able to put my own self out of the picture for a moment and really take in what my brother had built. So that's usually one of the steps, is try to see your sibling as they are. And then I noticed something astonishing. My brother and I walked in exactly the same way. We had the same gait. And I'd never seen that before. And I began to see something really extraordinary. I began to see what connected us rather than what divided us. That was the beginning of coming together as a team. And it's been huge. The idea of how you make it better with a brother and sister is, not, is a subject that we don't talk about, and we should, because the transforming aspect of turning your siblings into your confidants and into close friends 
is so powerful in a life. I call this now the power of siblings. A couple of years ago, Time Magazine did a cover story on the new sibling studies, and they talked about how our siblings are the dark matter that really defines us. And, you know, that was kind of Time Magazine law, journalist soundbite stuff, but the fact is they're on to something because it's just astonishing to me that we have had 80 years of psychiatry and only in the last 10 or 12 years have experts really begun to look at this subject. And it's huge. I mean, we do know a lot about twins. We know how twins influence each other. But how brothers and sisters have a power over each life, each other's life with these sibling icebergs is really something that's just being looked at. As I began to write this book, I panicked. I am a journalist. I've been writing for Vanity Fair now for a long time, and we are trained. Third person objective. Don't tell your own story. I was meeting my editor, Sarah Crichton, for the first time. I wanted to write about globalizing India, where I spend much time. And as we sit down, we suddenly discover that we both share a brother, and our brothers are mysterious to both of us. Well, within seconds, we had launched on our brothers, and the idea of, right, ta of even talking about India was put aside, and we were there when the cafe closed an hour or two later. We had launched on this subject, and at the end, she stood up and she said, this should be your next book, because this is a huge subject, brothers and sisters and their influence on each other, and your odd and not so unusual relationship with your brother, your older brother. And I said, oh, I couldn't. It's too personal. I could never write this. It would be like a, my opening of vein. And she said, no, think about it. So the next year I spent as a reporter interviewing so many different sibling experts, again, becoming that kind of overknowing expert that used to drive my own brother crazy. And at the end of that year, I could tell you a lot about attachment theory and mirror neurons and birth order and all the things that we read about, but I still didn't have any answers. Guess what? There aren't any real answers. That's one of the things that you learn. But a huge surprise I've had now writing the book is as I've gone around the country talking to groups about brothers and sisters and how we don't see each other and how powerful this is, I have been astonished to realize that this is so common. It's as common as the Asian flu. It is, again, about 45 or 50 percent of us do have very complex relationships with our brothers and sisters that we would like to change. So I'm often asked, if I wanted a simple way to make it better with my brother or my sister, what would, what, what are, give, a, give me a five point. So as I was coming over today, I wrote it down on a pad. The first one is, get on a plane, take action, don't, don't wait, just go. You know, again, I'm not an expert. I can only tell you what worked for me. Don't wait. Pick up the telephone. Don't wait for an invitation. You're probably not going to get it. There's a reason why you are stuck behind, stuck in this role playing. You know, we get stamped with role playing when we're kids, and it's very hard to get out of it. We become like minnows swimming in a well of childhood. And you, you, it's like there you are again, fighting in the packing house, freaking out about the pen top, fighting over how to grow a honey crisp. And it's not the way you are as an adult. So your first action needs to be get on the plane and go and take action. The second step is don't wait for a crisis. Because the fact is, if you have this complicated relationship, you're already in a crisis, whether you choose to recognize it or not. It's very easy to say, I have nothing in common with my brother. I did that for years, and that got me nowhere. You're in a crisis. Third step, hang in there. It's worth it. 
because it's going to be difficult. If you have one of these frozen relationships, often you need a bomb to blow it up and make it better. So the fourth step is have a support system, friends you can call up, Psych- you know, just any kind of an expert, a psychiatrist, anyone who can help you, who can be on that telephone and give you, uh, could buoy you up and to tell you this is worth it. This could be transforming. The fifth step is acceptance, realizing that often things may not change so easily. And sometimes you just don't get to understand everything. I have been so taken with something that Thoreau once said about the bloom of the present moment. Thoreau believed that we get a gift every day, and that is to have this extraordinary present, to always act as if whatever went before the backstory, the history, the bad relationships, the being tossed out the window, whatever it was, you are now in the bloom of now, he called it. Apples and oranges, it's powerful. This really did transform my life. So I want to throw it out to some questions. How many, who has a sibling story that they would like to weigh in with? Who's trying to make it better with a brother and sister? Anyone brave enough to volunteer? No? question that I had as we um, as we're pondering our, our sibling relationships um, in, in our minds is what sort of influence um, the parents can do to, to foster you know um, to better communication like both a, as children and then as the siblings gain into their adult life well that's a very good question Cliff uh, what can the parents do what well, they can do a lot actually you know they can help in, in they can make you believe that you're a team they can try to see each one of you separately it's very difficult though because often what happens in families is that parents project their own relationships onto their children they act out roles that were stamped into them and onto them in my own case in my family uh, my father had a very complicated relationship with his older sister Sister Anita Brenner, who was a, a rather well-known writer in Mexico, in fact, uh, was close to Diego Rivera and the painter Frida Kahlo, and and uh, my father, her younger brother, always believed that she was impossible. They stopped speaking when I was a child, and you know it would be very easy to say. And part of the book, this is as much a double story of that relationship, because one of the questions that drove me was. Um, was this repeated in my own life? You know, again, I learned by the by the end of this long quest, which I spent, I'm such a r- rational, I believed I was such a rational person, a reporter, believing that every question has an answer. I learned that that wasn't necessarily true. Are there any other questions from, from the audience, both either you know from personal stories or, or questions of, more in general? I have a question. Sure thing. Um, uh, but we have a YouTube audience, so we gotta be gotta be mindful. Hi, I just have a quick question. Did you ever get to find out why he FedExed you the package instead of talking to you or <laughs> That's a very good question. He person. FedExed me the package because it was part of his nature. He was a very controlling person, and he was uh, he did not want to have a conversation. What he said in the letter was, I know you're on deadline with a new article, and I didn't want to bring this up over Thanksgiving. But what he really was was terrified, asking me for my help, and yearning to connect in some way. That's what we discovered, this deep yearning to connect. It was so moving when I thought about it later that he was so overwhelmed that he couldn't even just pick up the telephone and, I, and say, I've had this news. We did get to that point, though, where we could speak in an undefended way. And it was huge when that cotton batting lifted. It was absolutely huge. Tra- again, I used the word. It was transformational. Right, are there um, other questions as well? Um, 
one, one thing that, that I was wondering about, I'll, I'll share a little bit of, of my sibling story. My sister and I, I think we, we get along really well and we you know, have had a you know, good relationship growing up, but um, as, as, as she grows up, it becomes a little bit more difficult to sort of you know, accept the both of us in, in the adult world. And I was wondering um, how, how, how you were able to transcend that relationship with, with your brother and just sort of strategies for, um, for, for generally, you know, like reevaluating the sibling relationship la later in life. Oh, this was so reevaluated. The idea that I would be standing here at Google and, and say to you that my brother turned out to be my guru, the most unlikely guru that you could ever imagine, that so often I think of, of, of things he said to me, like, go forward, and I watched him in the last years of his life, because he died quite young, um, I watched him obsessed with planting apples, never you know, having all of these wonderful trips, romances. There was one moment where I saw him dancing with a girlfriend uh, just through a window in his house, just determined never to live, you know, never not to live a moment of his life. And I remember thinking, even then, because I had just gotten to that point, Cliff, of being able to see him, I remember thinking, this guy is extraordinary. He has the secret. Again, what you ask, how to see that, it's to somehow get yourself out of it, to really try to see your sister out of the well of being these two minnows trapped in the well. That, you know, again, that role playing gets so stamped on us. And it becomes an immense task to just step back and say, um, and embrace your sibling for as they are, not as what you would like them to be. Great. Um, another question? Um, so I don't know if this was an issue in your relationship with your brother, but in uh, in some adult uh, sibling relationships, it becomes very complicated when the parents die. Um, sort of, you know, processing that whole emotion both yes. individually and within the, uh, the family unit. Do you have any interesting observations on that? Well, that's definition top, you look up the word crisis in the dictionary, or you put that word in Google, and that's the first definition that should come up, because to come together at that moment is incredibly challenging, depending on so much unresolved stuff that, you know, you start acting out again, you go right back to the romper room. Um, you know, in, 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 in so many cases, all you can do is just, you know, breathe and learn to go to somehow the power of silence because there's so much acting out that can go on. Uh, a, a wonderful strategy, you know, again, I'm not an expert and I failed at this much of the time, was learning the power of no reaction. That sometimes, you know, as they say in India, inaction is your most powerful form of action. And inaction of not reacting to everything. You know, brothers and sisters, siblings often have the battle of the rights. You know, how do you, who's right, who's wrong? Right there you've lost. The moment that you get into who's right and who's wrong, you're always going to be, you're going to be back in that role playing because that's irreconcilable. So if you say to yourself, irreconcilable is the starting point for new negotiation. You've got to start. You know, if once you're once you're stuck in who's right, who's wrong, you're nowhere. That's a power dynamic. That's I hope that helps. Cool. Are, are there um, other questions as well? Uh, just sort of an observation with my sister is that um, when we spend time together, uh, one of the things that we do agree on is that um, we can last for about two or three days before I think we, f we fall back into that scenario. Um, and, uh, you know, so I, I, we, we live in different states and that sort of thing, so we don't see each other that often. So, so the first two or three days is generally pretty pleasant, but then I think we fall back into sort of the childhood, childish ways and things like that. Um, Stuck. Yeah, yeah any, any thoughts on that? Sure. What's the age difference? 
three years. Who's younger? Who's older? I'm older. You're older. So you're you're the firstborn. And t- just give us a, just a just a, a just one sentence about your sister. What if your sister were here, and we said to your sister, "So what's the deal?" What would she say? Well, I, I think she would sort of echo what you said earlier. Just that we don't have a lot of shared interests. Mm-hmm. You know, so if I'm into um, outdoors and sports or something, then she's into. Um, you know, pop culture and movies or something like that. Does she think you're bossy and domineering? <laughs> Does she think you're a classic firstborn? Does she think, I mean, in other words, is she, is she putting her walls up because she's, you're a, you're a big, you're a classic big brother? Um, you know, I, I think that probably there's, there's truth in that. I think she probably thinks that, that, um, that I play the I'm always right role. Mm-hmm. Right and sort of boss her that that sort of thing. Yeah, that's a role. That that's a role that you know can drive a lot of little younger sibs crazy. And uh, I've often thought again, thinking about Hillary Clinton and this campaign. You know, we've put so many filters on this campaign: gender, age, race, every kind of filter you can possibly imagine. But no one has really looked at it from the sibling iceberg filter. And I'm wondering if a lot of people didn't respond to Hillary Clinton besides policy differences and every other reason of uh, was was she their bossy firstborn sibling? You know, it's hard to know. I wish, I, and I also somehow wish that the candidates had talked more about their own, would talk more about their own relationships with their brothers and sisters because who understands you more than your brother and sister? You've got the same DNA and you've shared a childhood. One, 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 one observation I'll close on. William James, the great 19th century thinker, often wrote about the core of self. And we keep ourselves often very, very hidden. That was, for me, one of the huge challenges of writing Apples and Oranges. And certainly we keep ourselves hidden from our parents as we're growing up to evolve. But we don't really keep ourselves hidden from our brothers and sisters. They know us extremely well, and we know them extremely well. And that makes us, can make us, very uncomfortable. It can also bring us a lot of joy. Oh, one more. Hi. Um, one thing I noticed with my sister, she's two years older than me and mm-hmm. was very domineering. Um, was that she had a certain perception of me, which was the way I was when I was growing up with her. Mm -hmm. And then when I left home, I changed, as everyone does. Mm -hmm. And a problem we had, which I think we've mostly resolved, but it took time, was that she still had this perception of me of the way I was when I was a kid, and she really couldn't accept that Mm -hmm. maybe I'd changed Mm -hmm. or had my own opinions now Mm -hmm. or really just had trouble seeing me for who I was Mm -hmm. um, after I'd left home. Well, that probably won't change for a long time. <laughs> I mean, this is this is just such a common thing. I'm again, I'm embarrassed to tell you that when I first landed in the Apple Country, I said to my brother, "Well, I'm in the Seattle airport. I thought I'd drive over to the Cascades." And he said, "I said it's just a two-hour drive." And he said, well, "You'd get lost on the way to the Walmart." And I said, "You know, I have worked all over the world, writing, filing stories, tracking down. You know, again, I have to show off the younger sister, tracking down dictators in remote countries." And then he pulled himself up and he said, "Yeah, but you have people who take you around. I mean, this is so common. You know, there you are, you're back fighting in the back seat of the car. No, it's it's very difficult. I mean, it, it, depending on your sister, talk." Talking helps a lot. Screaming and sometimes works. You just do. You just have to do whatever you can to get into their airspace. It's hard. It's very hard. Again, the sibling experts call this the Humpty Dumpty syndrome. You might be a classic Humpty Dumpty, and your sister might be a Humpty Dumpty. That means when you know it's so it's so simple a concept. You know that the, the Humpty Dumpty gets smashed when falling off the wall when the younger one comes along. And I tr- this a, a sibling psychiatrist told this to me in Washington as I was reporting and running around with my notebook, being an expert. 
And I said, come on, it cannot be that simple. It can't just be the Humpty Dumpty syndrome where the firstborn feels displaced and cracks. And Dr. Justin Frank said, yes, sometimes it is exactly that simple. Cool. Um, are there other questions as well? Um, my final question, because I wanted to, to get that in, um, as, you, as you wrote the book, you, know, you mentioned how you had to really take a step back and evaluate your, your writing style and inject more of yourself in, into your writing. I was wondering if, if that stuck with you and if, that's, if writing this book has had any more impact on, on your professional life as well. Absolutely. Again, it's been transformational. I, I've become fascinated by family relationships, how powerful they are. I really, really understand now that the, the, the greatest predictor for long-term happiness is the strong relationships you can forge with your family and your friends and it's really where I'm going to go in the future is staying on this the very personal and the family relationships outstanding well um, we'll have Marie available for some questions and answers afterwards and if you want to get that that book signed as well um, on behalf of, of Google we want to thank you very much for coming today it's been a pleasure thank you